And we pray that you will transform our heart, transform our life. Because we know that your word has such a power. Your word are yes and amen, O oh Lord. We thank you, Jesus. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Good morning, church. All right. It's going to get warmer today, so that's why I'm wearing short sleeves. I hope it is going to get warmer. Are you ready for the Word of God? Amen? All right. Let's get our Bible ready together, and let's read the Word of God. We're here for the Word of God. Amen, amen, amen. So we've been talking uh, throughout this past month, and even, you know, two months ago, we talk about uh, the aspect of our faith, which is giving and being generous and bringing our offering unto the Lord. Basically, uh, I want to I wanna welcome some of the parents who are here uh, as we are entering into the season of graduation. Welcome to Boston. Come on, let's give it up to our parents. All right. So uh, this year, as you all know, we, we want to cover the ground, the very basic of uh, our faith, why we do what we do, why we believe what we believe. So uh, we've been talking about the aspect of generosity, about why we bring our offering unto the Lord. And beginning of this month, we cover a series called True Life. All right. So this will be the fourth installment of the series. And we uh, glean from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 to 19. And verse 19 says, In this way they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold the life that is truly life. So the life that is truly life or a true life in other translation. So we, you all know how Paul uh, exhorted Timothy before. He says, Command those who are rich that they will not be arrogant and put their hope in wealth. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deed." to be generous, and to be willing to share. Only when they live their life in such a way will they be having a life that is truly life. All right? So this is something that, that we learn. And throughout the past week, I've shared with you about different types of roles uh, in regards to this, uh, the, the money and the wealth that God has uh, given to us. So we have roles or positions when it comes to the money that God have entrusted upon us. So as the people entrusted his resources and blessings, it is critical that we understand our roles and positions, right? So here in America, we have a, an expression that says we wear many hats. Anybody ever heard of that before? All right. So I bring here come some hats. I love hats, baseball caps, but my hats are not like that. So when it comes to money and possessions, you know, we as Christians, if we study the Bible, we understand that we were given many hats, all right? So last, the, the first uh, hats that we are to wear is that we are to master. We are to master our money. I'll do everything to keep you entertained and to get you to zoom in to remember what I shared, all right? Because I shared this with sweat, blood, and tears, and if you forget it, you know, what a, what a shame, all right? So... I don't have that kind of hat, but I have baseball caps. So the first hat that God gave us to wear when it comes to money and possession, come on, help me say what it is. You have to. The wear, it's the hat of the master. Everybody say master. It means that you are not to own it, but you have to master your money. You know, Matthew uh, chapter 20, uh, 6, verse 24 says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will devote it to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So you can only serve one. So if you serve God, then money is not your master. In, in fact, money should be your slave. Money should be your, your tools, your instrument, your doormat, you know, where you, know, you use money, not let money use you. So we are commanded to master the money, all right? Because it's simple principle, what we don't master will master us. If you don't master your money or your wealth, your wealth or your money will master you. All right? So it's very simple. So God commanded us to master our money. You know, simple things like 
having a proper understanding that money must be earned, you know, and it means it has a limit, you know, and we, had, we need to have a plan. We need to tell our money where to go. We need to budget, all right? So that's how we master our money. If we don't tell our money where to go, our money will tell us where to go, all right? So what is the first head? Come on, everybody say. Master, Master. all right. So the second head that Pastor Ron shared last week is the head of a sower. Everybody say sower. sower. All right? So it's the head of a sower, 2 Corinthians 9, 6, 11. You know, if you sow sparingly, you will reap sparingly. Whoever sow generously, come on, everybody, you know, will also reap generously. He who supplies the seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase the store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in everywhere. He who, what? So generously, will, uh, sparingly, will also reap sparingly. Amen? He who supplies us with the seed to sow. So we are to be a sower. It means that all the money, the finances, the wealth, the resources that God entrusted to us, they are likened to a seed that we are to sow. All right? So the only thing that is good and proper to do for a seed is to sow. You cannot eat it. You know, you cannot hoard it. The longer you hoard, the more it will be spoiled and use its potential, use its usability. But when you sow it, it will multiply. You know, a few seeds, uh, this is the rule in sowing, you know, a few seeds make a small harvest, but a lot of seed make a big harvest, right? It's, not, it's a no-brainer. The amount of harvest will be much more than the seeds being planted. The form of the harvest will be different than the seed. You planted a seed of apple, you don't get a fruit, or you, you don't get a tree of seed, uh, apple seed, but you get apple, all right? So God is our source and he will bless the seed we sow, and God will bless those who sow. God will bless the seed we sow, and God will bless those who sow. Amen? So what is the second head? Everybody? Sower. Tell your neighbor, we are a sower. Come on. So you need to be faithfully sowing the seed that God has entrusted to you. Now today I want to talk about the last, uh, the last head. You know, which is the head of what it called steward. Everybody say steward. steward. All right. So I'm not going to wear this throughout the whole sermon. But I just want to illustrate to you, we wear many hats in retrospect to our roles, to our money and finances. All right. Everybody say steward. All right. So what is steward? You know, steward in definition, by simple definition, it means a person who manages another's property or financial affairs. Underline that word another. One who administers anything as the agent of another or others. There it was. There's that word again. A person who has charge of the household of another. All right? One appointed to supervise the provision and distribution. Not the hoarding, not the guarding, but the distribution of food and drink in an institution. That's a steward. You need to know, I need to know, we all need to be reminded that when it comes in retrospect to money and wealth, the Bible speaks of us as a steward and never in the context of an owner. Let's turn together to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 25, verse 14 to 30. Matthew chapter 25, verse 14 to 30. This is one of the parables that Jesus gave. Uh, I want to encourage you to open your Bible and read it with your own eyes. Uh, so that you, you really get the benefit of it, all right? Matthew 25, verse 14 to 30. It says, For it will be like a man going on a journey. In other translation, it says, The kingdom of God is likened to a man that are uh, set to make a journey, who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled account with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, 
you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. His master said to him, well done. Everybody say, well done. Well done. Not a steak, all right? Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, who had the two talents, came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I have made you two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. Now, so I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant. Not translation, wicked and lazy. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gathered where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money <coughs> with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him. Who has the ten talents? For to everyone who has, will, be more, will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Amen. Amen. It's a long passage, but it's worth it. It's really a powerful passage. So let me give you the context to it. Uh, um, this is actually, well, uh, given that most of us here are students, so I think uh, you all understand when I talk about this. So when you first started the semester, I think the most important day not to miss the class is the first day, right? Why? Because usually in the first day, the professor will give you a brief introduction to what the course is all about. And what's most important is that the professor usually will hand out, uh, you know, like few sheets of paper. Uh, it's called the syllabus, all right? So in the syllabus, you will discover, oh, what to expect in the course, what are the textbooks to be bought, what will, be, uh, what will the meeting, the, the class uh, meeting be structured at, lecture, participation, everything. But the most important part of what a syllabus, it will tell you how you will be graded in that course. It will tell you, uh, okay, midterm will weigh like what, 20, 10 percent, you know, and then final will be, I don't know, 5 percent, you know, and then 95 percent will be participation. It means that is not one class you can cut, all right? So you have to pre present, you know. I, I've, I've had a syllabus before when I was a student. The, the professor literally said, I don't care whether you come to class or not. As long as you blah, 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 blah. So you know, pretty much it's spelled out there. It's important to not miss the first day because in the syllabus it will tell you how you will be graded. You know, because if you are to make it in that class, you need to know how your participation need to be adjusted. So this passage is pretty much, is that. It's likened to a syllabus that Jesus handed out to his disciples. So when this passage, this was toward the end of Jesus' ministry, chapter 25. So Jesus was about done with his early ministry. And he's making his way to the cross. And that's why he wants to prepare, he is beginning his destiny of death at the cross. So he wants to prepare his follower. He wants to prepare his disciples how to live their life at their best after his death and how to live their life awaiting for his return. So he wants the disciple to know how God will evaluate their life. Right? So that's why he begin in chapter 24. If you read a chapter back, you know, he begin by preparing them by saying, you know, his coming will be like a thief in the night. And how... When he comes, they will all be accountable. They will all be held accountable for what they've done with the gifts that God has given to them, namely their life and everything that comes with your life. And that's why he says, if anybody would know 
when the thief would come like, and they would, you know, be watchful. But the problem is no one knows when the thief will come. That will be my coming is like. So that's why in, in that aspect, Jesus began to prepare his disciples of how to live awaiting for his return, you know, after his death. So that's why he gives them this parable to help them to understand what God expects of them, how they will be graded in their life. You know, and we, we read this in Matthew 25, verse 14, it begins by saying, For it will be like a man going on a journey. You know, Jesus setting himself, you know, before he goes back to his father. And who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. You know, I underline this because this verse can be, you know, like a couple sermons. And just this sermon alone kind of sets the tone. And if, if you can see, I pray this morning that the Holy Spirit will open your heart. That you get to understand, you know, square one. You know, he called his servant. That makes him the Lord. <laughs> you know, we are his servant. And then it says, entrusted to them his property. His servant, his property. His servant, his property. I pray that this word will be seared again and again in your mind as you grow in, in, in your faith, in, 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 Christian, in your Christian faith. You know, his, ser- his servants, his property. I, I, I hope by now you understand the sovereignty of his lordship. All right? To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, and to each according to his ability. So here's the big concept. It's a big concept, but actually it doesn't take a big brains to understand it. The big concept is that we're not owners, but we're all stewards. Amen? Come on, everybody say it together. We're not owners. But stewards, I think I quoted several times, Psalm 24 says, The earth and everything there is, is the Lord. The earth and everything, the whole universe belongs to the Lord. You know, in this chapter, His servants, His property. So the big idea is that we're not owners, we are stewards. We're not owners, we're stewards. I I choose this translation because... I love the fact that they didn't say he called his servants and gave them his property. But instead, he used the word entrusted his property. I love this word because within the word entrusted, in the middle, there's that word trust. Everybody say trust. Trust. You know, the Bible says that what is desired of a servant is that he may be found trustworthy. All right? So that's the measure of a servant. So he called his servant and he entrusted them with his property. Entrusted. You know the word entrusted. I check in Webster. The, the other variants that are less commonly used of the word entrusted is the word entrust. It means that it was being handed over in trust. It means that when you transfer the ownership or the, uh, uh, the, the possession of a ship of, to, uh, to that person, it is based on trust. It is because you trust that person, all right? So, and trusted, it means to confer a trust on, to deliver something in trust to, or to commit to another with confidence. So here's a master who fully trusts and entrusted the servant. You know, I, I know you, are, you can be trusted, so I want to entrust it to you with this. You know, by this understanding, you understand that, you know, whatever being handed over, it, the, the ownership doesn't transfer. It is the trust that was handed, extended unto you. The word entrusted in Greek, it is paradidomi. It means to give into the hands of another, to give other into one's or power of use, you know, like power of attorney, or to deliver to something, to, some, to one something to keep, to use, to take care or manage. So God has called us to be entrusted his property. He trusts us enough to hand it over his property because everything belongs and comes from him. Your life, your opportunity, your career, your family, your money, your brain, everything, your net worth, your network, everything. Your good looks, your strength, your vitality, 
everything, all the asset, everything that you can think of, that you can see, that you can touch, that you can comprehend, everything in our life comes from and belongs to Him. And He gave it to you because He trusts you to be trustworthy. He entrusted His property to you. Hello? Oh, is it getting hotter here? This is the fact that we must begin with everything comes from and belongs to God. You know, it's a big concept, but it actually doesn't take a big brain to understand. It's actually, you know, uh, even uh, little kids can understand that. And then another big concept that we must understand is that you are only entrusted for a season. Hello? You know, how many of you understand this? Anybody here above 50? <laughs> Doesn't want to. You know that by the time you are above 50, so many change. Whatever used to go up starts going down. Only I can laugh at that. <laughs> and some of you. You know, nothing lasts forever. Come on, young man, young woman, let me look at you when I talk to you. You think you're going to stay vibrant all the time? Let me tell you something. There will be a season of slowness. There will be a season of downtimes. You know, that's why today the Bible say whenever there is an opportunity to call today, you know, never stop of doing good. Never stop of maximizing your opportunity. Never stop of living the life that God meant for you to live. Because you're only entrusted for a season. You, I mean, all the assets, all the richness, all the power, all the influence, everything that God entrusted to you right now, mark my word, you're only entrusted it for a season. Because soon the real owner will come. Just like this word in verse 19 says, now after a long time, we don't know what that long time will be for every single one of us. But make no mistake about it, he is returning. The master of those servants came. Now we all know Jesus himself by his own admission, Matthew 24 says, his coming will be like a thief in the night. We don't know. We don't know. But make no mistake about it. The real owner will come sooner or later. So we're only entrusted this for a season. Everybody say a season. Amen? So it means that after the season pass, it will probably no, no longer be there. Or maybe our ownership or our responsibility of that stewardship of whatever it is will probably cease. So make the most of your life. Make the most of your life and be mindful how you live your life. You know, we all talk about money, power, influence, everything. You know what is the best resource God gave to you? It's time. Because we cannot prolong it. I mean, you can put into slow motion your camera, but in your life. And once it's gone, it's gone. It's more important. It's more precious than money. And think about it. You only were given the opportunity or this time for a season. For a season. For a season. I mean, we're all excited that winter is over, spring is here, and before long, new season is coming, which is summer. That's why I'm prophetically dressed. But even summer is not going to last forever. So we need to do what we need to do at the season that we are in. Come on, are you listening? You're only entrusted for a season. As high and might as you are, as vibrant as you are, as strong, beautiful, handsome, as rich as you are, listen to my word this morning. You're only entrusted for a season. We should not boast for something that God only gave to us, entrusted to us temporarily, right? Another big concept, you know, is that there will come a day of accountability. 
Make no mistake about it. One day, the real owner will come and, you know, okay, I've given you this life. I've given you this age. I've given you this opportunity. I've entrusted into your bank account. I've entrusted into your health. I've entrusted into your marriage. I've entrusted into your life. What have you done with it? You may live a fruitful life, but the big question is, does it further the cause of his kingdom? Or is it just building your own kingdom? That's the big question because all that matters is this kingdom. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled account with them. That word really should bring shivers down our spine. Accountability. Make no mistake about it. That's one day we cannot claim, oh, sorry, I had a stomachache. I ate a bad pizza. I, I, you know, you know, it will come to you. You don't even need to come. It will come to you. Every single one of us will have to stand before him. He will settle that account. And in the end, the ledger will be shown, left or right, whether it's going to be his kingdom or your kingdom. It will show. Oh, pastor, this is a hard message to hear. Better hear it now than when that time comes. Because by that time, it's too late. Are we preaching judgment, Pastor? No, I'm preaching love because I love you. I'm reminding you that this day is coming. And no one can tell when. But make no mistake about it. We're only entrusted for a season and the day of accountability is coming at us. So he called three servants. One he gave five. Another he gave, come on, help me, two. And then the other one is? One. So we all, all we focus about is the one. Right? And then this, we all know five work hard, and then it becomes another five, which is ten. Two work hard, invested immediately. It says that they go right away, invested. It becomes another two, and then it becomes four, all right? But this one is interesting. <laughs> immediately he buried it in the ground. So in 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 first. He who received the one talent went and dug it in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled account. And then, listen, he also who had received one talent came forward and saying, Master, I know you to be a hard man reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. I was afraid and went and hid and your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. You know, most of us, when we read this, you know, we have a tendency in this world that we want to favor the underdog. You know, that's a culture in these days. So sometimes because of that, we block out all the other facts. And it could be that we're blocking out the truth only to favor the underdog. And when I was reading at this, oh, the master is being unreasonable. Look at him. He says, you are a hard man. Lord, you are being unjust. But we make, we, we conveniently... <laughs> Because of our sentiment, we forget all the other facts. We forget the other fact that all two other servants complied just nicely. And we forgot the fact that this master actually should not give his servant anything. You know, the talent is equivalent to a, a year's wage. So this is a lot of money. In other translation, modern translation says it's a bag of gold. We don't know how, how big of a bag it is, but it's huge. He, to begin with, the master should not give him anything. But he gave. And secondly, how I know this is a good master, because he says that the master gave to each of them based on their ability. So it means that this master really know the servant. Really know. You know. And you have to understand, in the context of this teaching, the servants, they are not slaves, because slaves are just running tasks without shedding a shed of brain. But these are managers. These are people who are given power. So, you know, this, this is actually a good master who gave them ample time and trusted his wealth. Given in trust. And the reason why he is given only one, because he knows that mm, most likely, you know, but out of my generosity, I'll give you anyway. Oh, there's another problem that can be another sermon, you know, you know, five to one, five to one, you know, when we start comparing. That's another issue, but let's talk about stewardship right now, <laughs> because that will be another issue, all right? 
But the master rebuked him and said, you wicked and slothful. In other words, you unfaithful servant. Now I want to remind you because, you know, as a, when we look at the syllabus, we want to know how we will be graded. So important points we need to take into account so that we don't miss it, all right? Here's how you can be unfaithful with the resources that God gave to you. Number one, if you neglect it. The servant was given gold. Gold was mined from earth. You know what he did? He brought it back to earth. He just simply neglected it as, as if it doesn't mean anything. You know, God gave you resources. God gave you health. You know, I'm, I stand accountable, you know. I, I, I wish I should have known this a long time ago. But I'm trying to live healthier, eat better. I exercise, you know. Some of you who are born skinny, you don't feel the need to, you know, be healthy. Because I'm just health, pastor. You're looking at it. Yeah, I know. You know. Whereas the rest of us, we need to work hard, sweat, and blood, and tears every day. But you know what? Don't neglect your health. Don't neglect your body. Because everything that goes up eventually will go down. Mark my word. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I don't see how else going to make you to remember that. Are, how, how about your money? You know, even those who understand the basic of stewardship have a tendency to think that, oh, I already gave what belongs to God, 10%. So this 90 is all up to me. I can use it however I want it. That's neglect. You don't understand. You know, how, how, how about the opportunity that get, God gave to you? Most of you who are here, as a student, you know your parents send you here not to make content on the social media, but to study. <laughs> you know, if after you are studying, you have like 10, 5, 30 minutes, okay, you can content, you know, or whatever. But don't neglect the opportunity that God gave to you here. I, I've heard so many students say, Pastor, I don't like my school. I don't like my major. Do you know how many millions of people back home in your country that actually willingly take your place without even asking? We neglect the opportunity that God gave to us. How can we be unfaithful when we abuse it? What is abuse? Abuse is abnormal use. You know. One day I try I, I, I was in, in a in a uh, in a tool shed, I need to bang on a nail. I couldn't find a hammer. You know, I find a biggest plier I can and I just bang it. And you know what? It slipped and instead of the nail it banged my finger. It's not the plier's fault. It's my fault because I abnormally used what is to be a plier to drive a screw as a hammer. And I reap the result of my abuse. You know. Gold was made for trade. Gold was made for payment. And what the master was saying, you know, do trades. Do economic measure when I'm gone. So that when I'm, I come back, you know, I will receive the interest. Or at least invest it to a bank or give it to the servant with five who becomes ten. So that when I came back, but instead, he put it on the ground. He abnormally used what is to be invested, but he hid it. And because of that, the master see it as unfaithfulness. And last but not least, unprofitable. Come on, everybody say unprofitable. You need to understand that this is a serious issue with the Lord. Because he said, you should at least, verse 27 says, you ought to have invested my money with the bankers and my, at my coming I should receive what was my own with interest. You should put it where it will multiply. You should use it in a way that it will generate. Because we are sower and we are also investor. That's one of the heads that God has given to us. And don't, he, this is not my word, this is Jesus' word. And the, mass, the servant was rebuked because he was unprofitable. In other words, unfaithful in generating 
prophet. I challenge you. How are you living your life in such a way that you bear profit? It's not that we measure everything based on gain and loss. But the message here is that you need to be more careful how you live your life. You need to be more careful how you spend your money. You need to be more careful how you utilize the resources that God has given to you. Because it is only given to you for a season. And one day the real owner will come and evaluate the manner of your usage. Whether or not you'll be found responsible. Whether or not the usage of that resource bring good use to other people. So what is stewardship? Stewardship is the use of God-given resources for the accomplishment of God-given goal. It's not just for our own enjoyment. It's not just for our own hobby. You know, never for once think that if you have given the life that you are living right now, you think you deserve it. Hello? Oh, you know what? I earn it. You know, God, the least you can do is bless me. After all, I'm your child. It is that kind of thinking that will get you to be in terror when he returns. You need to understand that in the Bible, there is a purpose of every blessing. Beginning all the way from the book of Genesis in the uh, 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 Abrahamic covenant, I will bless you so that you will be a blessing. Everything comes from him and belongs to him. What is stewardship? Stewardship is not content simply with the goal of being more generous. Being more generous should be the result of good stewardship. Some people say, oh, why people are thinking that, oh, stewardship is being more generous? Because their idea of stewardship is expense management, not investment management. The real meaning of stewardship is investment management. You... you Manage what you will invest. And you need to take good care. You need to observe where is the good ground where I can invest. You need to listen to the word of God. What do you need to do? There are things that God already said literally. Support his kingdom. Bring your offering. Bring your offering into the ministry. Support those, the, 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 the widows, the, the, uh, 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 the orphans, and all the other ministries. Those are good grounds. And God will reward whatever you have sown. But you know what? Gener a, a, a stewardship is not just simply being more generous. When you have a good investment strategy, management strategy, automatically you will become more generous. What's true is usually we cannot be generous because we have not been a good manager of the investment. Hello? We want to give, but we can't give because we have debts. Hello? You know. But what I find funny is that we will always have time for our hobby. We will, have, we will always have money for what we like. But whenever it comes to church and ministry, we're broke. Oh, I'm busy, Pastor. Oh, I have finals. But you can still... You know, scroll down mindlessly on the social media. You can, you can do many things. When it comes to your own personal enjoyment hobby, you will always have time. You will always have money. But when it comes to the kingdom of God, if that's the truth, we have problems, folks. Because to begin with, you are enjoying it on borrowed money and borrowed times. It all comes from him and belongs to him. And all he asks is that you honor him with what he has given to you. And if you will not do that, that's bad. Stewardship is measured by return and impact, not by what is saved. Some people are a good saver and they thought they're a good steward. It's probably a very minuscule, a minimal beginning of definition of what a steward, stewardship is all about. But it's not that. A good steward is not only responsible 
at what they dispense, but also making very sure that when they do, it will generate a return and it will be impactful. Even though the impact might not be the same money. Remember, what we sow, we'll receive differently than what we sow. Hello? Are you still breathing? Is it okay? Stewardship often is defined by risk and not by playing it safe. And let me explain by this. doesn't mean that we are to be uh, irresponsible. But there are times God, being the owner of everything, will tell you to launch the seed into a place where business-wise or personal opinion-wise, it's not a good business practice. Hello? When the disciple have already told the whole night, catching no fish, Jesus said, do it once again, throw it to the other side. That's not a good practice. But there is a risk in following him. And many times the risk is going with his wisdom instead of with your experience. It may not be a good business practice. When we first brave ourselves to lease a space for our building, that's not a good business practice. Why? I'll tell you why. We don't have the money. We don't have the money. The money is tight. But we sense it. I sense it in my heart. This is what God would want us to do. Prayerfully, through the word of God. And Lord, lo and behold, he's the owner of everything. He's the owner of the cattle in a thousand hills or the thousand hills in a one cattle or whatever. <laughs> I always got mixed up. But he's the owner of everything. If it's his vision, then he will supply his provision. Hello? Many of you, have you ever done something that you are so nervous, but you know it, it gets to be done, it needs to be done? Have you ever done something that caused your palm to be sweaty, you know? But you know very well within your heart, this needs to be done. You know, because within your heart, if you are a praying person, if you believe in the Lord, this is the scenario. Many times God will direct you just the same way he commanded Peter to go out of the boat. Remember the, that widow with Elijah? He, uh, this is all we have at home. But Elijah says, make it first for me. And you will never, you will have a flower and oil that will never run out. Stewardship is often defined by risk. Following God, even always defined by risk, not by playing it safe. You know, a ship is safest in the harbor, but that is not what ship is made for. Hello? All right? So church, I want to challenge you this morning. Through this, Jesus says, this is how you ought to live while you await my arrival. This is the syllabus. <laughs> this is how we will be graded at the end of the day. Everything comes and belongs from the Lord. We are not owners. We are stewards. We're simply caretakers. It was entrusted upon us. And we are only entrusted this for a season. There will time come the season will be over. And there will be a day of accountability. I pray this morning that we will not be like that servant with one talent and that we will not receive the rebuke for that person. But instead, we will receive the salutation. We will receive the commendation from our Lord as we're given to the servant with five and two. And this is what God says. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. It's actually not little. <laughs> it's a wage of a year. But to God, he's not bound by dollar signs or numbers. But even the smallest one matters to him. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Oh my, how I long to hear that in the end when I get to stand before him. You know, I mean, you know, when we've been apart with each other for quite a long time, you know, when we first come together, when I first came home from America to Indonesia, you know, people would say, welcome, welcome. But there is a word, there's an exhortation that is more rewarding than just welcome. It is well done. 
And by that salutation, it kind of gives you an idea that there is things that we must do. And we must do it well so that we can receive this exhortation. Well done in the end. I challenge you, young and old, you have been entrusted with so many, so many of his property. I pray that you will not neglect it. I pray that you will not abuse it. I pray that you will use it in such a way that it will generate profit into the kingdom of God. Amen, church? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that your word will speak deep into the heart of every believer. I pray that you will challenge them. Holy Spirit, continue to work. Even as I stop talking, you will continue to bring conviction into the heart of every believer that we will be responsible steward, O oh Lord. That we will be trustworthy steward. That we will not be wicked and slothful, but that we will be faithful steward of God. Help us not to be arrogant with things that does not even belong to us. It is yours. If we can be this powerful, if we can be this prosperous, if we can be this living this life with such abundance, network, net worth, influence and impact, Lord, it is not our strength. It is only by your grace. It is only because you choose to entrust me with your property. So Lord, remind us that we are only entrusted for a season. Remind us that we will be found faithful when that day of accountability will finally come upon our life. Holy Spirit, I pray this morning that you will speak deep within our heart that our view with our possession, money, and wealth will change. And we will align ourselves with the biblical tenets so that we will not fail when the day of accountability finally come to us. Help us, O oh Lord, that every single believer, I pray, Lord, that every single believer in this church and everyone who is listening through this message online, I pray in the name of Jesus that we will live a life that is profitable for your kingdom. And we will live a life, O oh Lord, that will be worthy of such commendation in the end when you say, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi Church, my name is Alfred and I serve in the Multimedia and Carousel Ministry here at Boston City Blessing Church. Today we are at Brant Point Lighthouse in Nantucket Island. Behind me you see the lighthouse which seems small right now, but this lighthouse is such an important beacon of light for the ships in the water, especially during times of storm or during times of darkness. The Word of God in John 1 verse 4 to 5 says, The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. Similar to this lighthouse, we are created as a beacon of light to the people around us. But unlike this lighthouse, we have the ability to move and go into the places that we work, the places that we live, to be a beacon of light that is not stationary, but that can come to the people that need it the most. Whether it's our generosity, our giving, our love, our mercy, God has given us this opportunity and the gift to be the light to those people around us, wherever we may be, not just in the church, but in the places that we find ourselves in our daily lives. Whether it's in school, whether it's in work, where has God put you? where you can be a lighthouse. I pray that similar to that lighthouse, 
we can serve as a ray of light for the people in the darkness, for those people to help them find a path, especially a path into God's love, His mercy, and His overwhelming grace. Let's pray as we give today. Dear Father God, we're praying today as we prepare our hearts for giving and our offering to you, um, that you may bless these gifts, Lord, that you may use them to bring light to those people that need it the most, that you may use our gifts to bring love and, and light into dark places. Father, we surrender everything up to you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. give generously. Amen? <laughs> Amen. Pastor, is our church in need of money? No. We are in need of generosity follower. Amen? We are in need of raising disciples. So we are not concerned. God will supply. But I know that when God supplied, He didn't supply through heaven, you know, by opening the windows of heaven, but He supplied through the obedience of generous disciples like you and I. Amen? So let's be partaker of the kingdoms of God. Let's all stand as we close our service this morning. Oh, God is a good God. Amen. How many of you are grateful for everything that God has given upon your life? Amen. God is a good God. He's an owner of everything. He's faithful in His word. He's faithful in His provision. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, as we... Go home, O oh Lord. Remind us, O oh Lord, of your word. May your word continue to ring within our heart, within our mind, O oh Lord, that we will never forget who we are. Thank you for being such a generous creator, such a generous God, such a generous master who entrusted so many upon our life, O oh God. Lord, bless us, O oh God, as we live this place. Remind us to be a generous steward in this life, O oh Lord, that we may be able to contribute to the furtherance of your kingdom. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace. And may the favor of the Lord our God rest upon you and establish the work of your hands always, from now until the end of times, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Happy Sunday. And again I say, again I say, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, again I say, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, again I say, rejoice in the Lord. Yeah.